thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening. And as I look out and as I hear that there are 700 people here, I was thinking back to when I got started in what we now call cybersecurity. And I'm pretty sure that this conference is larger than my first DEF CON. <laughs> the world is changing. And it's changing, it seems, faster and faster. And I think one of the things that I find is that models help me understand the change. And so when I think about threat modeling and I think about the rate of change, my hope is that this talk will be interesting and useful and also help you get a handle on the rapidly changing world in which we live. So. As, as Tomas said, I helped create the CVE. I helped select content for Black Hat. I've done a lot of work in threat modeling. I fixed auto run. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I think about threat modeling and I think about what we are here to achieve when we threat model, I, I think about engineering more secure systems, right? This seems like a good goal. It seems like an important goal. And as we do so, we want some structure. We want to be systematic about it. We don't want to select this shiny thing that's in front of us and say, this, this little bit is everything that matters in cybersecurity. We need some breadth. We need the ability to think in a comprehensive way about the problem. And when I think about this, and when I think about some of the battles that I've fought over the years to improve this piece of security or that piece of security, I have a slightly more modest goal. And that goal is to engineer a consistent lack of surprise. Sometimes the people above me, the people in a leadership position, and these days I work as a consultant, so the people, for who, the people who I'm helping don't want as much security in their product as I do. Okay, that's their choice, right? That's the goal of an executive, is to make the trade-offs that build successful products, whatever those, product, whatever those trade-offs might be. The thing that I hope they don't do is they don't miss an important security problem. Um, to use a current example, they don't miss the fact that the angle of attack sensor on the Boeing 737 MAX is a single point of failure. That was apparently a surprise to Boeing management, and I think that's, that's unfortunate, that we should look as we build security products, as we build IT products, as we bring technology into the center of our society, that we are not surprised by the failures of security. That we say, that would be too expensive to fix. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. But we know, and we need techniques that give us this systematic way of discovering whether or not what we're building is going to have security problems later on. It's also very important to me, as I think about threat modeling, that the techniques we build the techniques that we use work for the various people who are trying to use them. I talk to a lot of people who have these very big aspirational ideas about what a security process should look like. And they don't actually work for anyone but that person. We need security techniques that scale to the problems that we face as a society. And the other thing that's important is we're here at IT Security Exchange. We should collaborate. We should talk. We should learn from one another. We should engage with one another. And so I'm excited to be here for that as well. And so one of the, one of the questions people ask me is, what is threat modeling? And re oh. I hit the wrong button here. Is this the back button? That's the back button. Cool. What is threat modeling? Um, threat modeling is understanding the technology you're using. <laughs> and so what threat modeling is, threat modeling is about abstracting away. It's getting rid of detail so that you can see the forest, not the trees. 
And so we use models of the things that we're working on. We use models of the problems we may encounter, and we bring these together to help us conceptualize the security of the system as a whole. And so today, there we go. So today I want to share with you two things. I want to share a simple approach to threat modeling, top 10 lessons I've learned along the way. And so, wow, almost, almost 15 years ago, I, I took a job at Microsoft, and my boss said to me on my first day, Adam, this threat modeling thing is messed up. Please fix it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I don't know. Step one is probably to convince me of what I mean. <laughs> OK. Um, and I appreciate that, the freedom that I was given. I appreciate the opportunity to really grapple with the problem because some super smart folks like Mike Howard and Window Snyder had gone and helped product teams threat model. And they would go in and they would guide them through the process of threat modeling. And then they would say, do you have that? Microsoft engineers tend to be pretty smart folks. They'd say, yep, got it. And they'd go off and work with the next team. And then a month later, two months later, they'd call up and say, hey, this thing that we did, it didn't work for this next thing I tried to apply it to. What do I do? And so they'd give them an answer, and they'd give them another answer. And over time, the official process that we had listed in some documentation had 17 steps, starting with make a list of all of your assumptions, make a list of all of your attackers, all of your assets. And you know where those steps came back into the process? Where the outputs of those steps came back into the process? Anyone have a guess? Nowhere at all. <laughs> Great. There's nothing I like more than doing work and putting it on the shelf and never looking at it again. Um, and so one of the first things I said is we need to simplify this. We need to break this down into things that people can understand where each step is useful. And so I created this simple framework. It's four questions. What are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And did we do a good job? And these questions are at the heart of threat modeling. They are my north stars. Whenever I get confused because I'm working on a complicated problem, I don't know what I should do, I think back and I say, how does the work that I'm doing intersect with, this, with one of these questions? And it gives me guidance. And so I, I bring these questions to you and say that you should, you should put these at the heart of your work. And not only, not only do we put this at the heart of the, our work, but we put this at the heart of collaboration. The word we is super important here. Used to say you. I used to come into a room and say, what are you working on? Now I say, what are we working on? Because it is my goal to collaborate. It's my goal to engage with the people who are building a product and help them do a better job. And I have to do that by being part of it. I, have, I can't say, here's me. I'm an expert. I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell you what to do. I mean, maybe I could, and maybe it would even work sometimes. But really, I want to collaborate. I want to say, how about let's try this? Bring people along with me. The growth of our field, the dramatic growth of our field, means that we need the social skills. We need the ability to work with people, Those, the listening, the collaboration that really allows us to solve the big problems that we face in technology and in society. And I feel that these questions really help us to do so. So let me get technical for a minute and make this concrete for those of you who are on the more technical side. So when I ask, what are we working on? I can draw a simple picture. I often draw these on whiteboards. And so I might have a web application and a customer, and there's some data flowing back and forth. OK, cool, we understand that. And then there's a database back end, and I can think about that. And I can put this in a little boundary that constrains. These are our things, and there are other people's things. Maybe I have someone doing some content creation. 
and the content goes back and forth. And with a diagram like this, I can start asking questions about what will go wrong. I can say, who is the customer? How do we authenticate them? How do we make sure we're not displaying data for someone else's account? Or if this web app uses the blockchain, how do we make sure that they're seeing the right keys that we're storing on their behalf? Similarly, with content creation, if someone wants to upload content, who allows that? How do we make those decisions? How do we ensure that the right people are putting the right data in the right place? We can ask that from a really simple diagram, and we can start understanding the entirety of the system and digging in in ways that we need to. And so, quest so question one, we can start with really, really simple diagrams that help us understand what we're working on and help share a picture, of help develop a shared picture of what we're working on. And then I want to go to move on to the question of what can go wrong. And when I ask what can go wrong, Stride is a mnemonic. I find it a helpful way to structure my thinking about any system that I'm looking at. So Stride stands, and I say this a lot, Stride stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information, disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. You all have that? Good, let's move on. <laughs> um, no, but, but you know, this, it's a mnemonic. And it's a way to think about what can go wrong. And to help you remember it, I have a few pictures, because a lot of people are visual learners. And so spoofing might be like Luke Skywalker pretending to be a stormtrooper. It might be someone pretending to be a Nigerian prince or an American voter and spreading their views. <laughs> um, it might be someone pretending to be a website, like paypal.com. It might be someone pretending to be a file. All of these are spoofing, pretending to be something or someone you're not. And we see these spoofing threats throughout the technological systems we work on. Tampering might be Ben Kenobi modifying a power converter. It might be somebody modifying an IoT device. It might be somebody modifying files in a database or on disk, packets flowing across a network. Each of these tampering unauthorized modification. Repudiation, it's an ugly word even for English, um, but it might be Han Solo saying there's been a reactor meltdown, very dangerous, and then, oh, everything's fine, and shooting the little communicator. It might be as simple as someone saying, I didn't get your email, or I didn't get an invitation. The package you sent me never showed up. Each of these is about denying that something has happened. And true or false, we need to construct systems that allow us to look back and say, this is what happened. We can do that with traditional means like logging. We can do it with new means like blockchain. All of it is about making sure we have a shared consensus about what's happened in the past. Now, information disclosure, um, you may notice I don't have any Legos. Um, and the reason for that is because some people will tell you that Star Wars is about Luke's journey into adulthood or his relationship to his father. But that's wrong. Sorry. Um, Star Wars, from the very opening scene where we see Princess Leia's ship being pursued by the, a Star Destroyer, all the way through this crucial scene, is about information disclosure and its consequences. <laughs> Especially with the last movie coming out, I recommend you go, you watch Star Wars again, and you think about it as the story of information disclosure. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but information disclosure is not simply about uh, Death Star plans. It can be about much more mundane information. It can be about customer lists. It can be credit card numbers. It can be business plans. It can be about the fact of communication between people. You know, again, not to be political, but the fact that Rudy Giuliani is talking to the president of the Ukraine might be interesting, whether or not you know what they're saying. Right, so the fact of communication can be interesting information for information disclosure, also for privacy. Denial of service. <laughs> Might be a uh, freezing Han Solo and carbonite. Might be about absorbing all of your disk, 
a denial of service attack, chews up your network. It might be chewing up your cloud budget. It might be eating the batteries in your IoT device. Lastly, the E in stride stands for elevation of privilege. This might be Ben Kenobi saying these aren't the droids you're looking for. It might be someone finding a hidden admin panel on your website. So stride, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege is a way to answer the question, what can go wrong? Now, for purposes of this talk, I'm mostly going to skip over what are we going to do about it and did we do a good job. But I do want to say briefly that one of the things that makes Stride useful is that Stride, the column on uh, your left, is a set of threats to properties that we want a system to have. And we have technologies that we can use to develop and deliver on those properties. And so it's a useful way to go from what can go wrong to what are we going to do about it. With that, I'd like to share with you the top 10 lessons that, that I've learned along the way. And one of the things about working on threat modeling for a long time is that I think I've been yelled at by more people because their threat modeling didn't work right than anyone else on the planet. And no one likes being yelled at, but I take some solace in knowing that people were trying to do something and it wasn't working, but they really wanted it to. And so they came and yelled at me because it wasn't working. And what I realized is that all of the reasons that threat modeling wasn't working were traps were things that people fell into because they were trying to do the right thing and it didn't work out. So trap number one is to say, search your feelings. Or in security, we often say, think like an attacker. Now, in Star Wars, whenever someone says, Luke, search your feelings, he does something dumb. Um, which makes for a great plot device, but a really bad engineering tool. And so why is think like an attacker that same thing? It's the same thing because when you say think like an attacker, and I'll tell you a little story here. I was right after I joined, joined Microsoft, I was in a meeting, and I said, think like an attacker to someone. And he sort of scowled at me and went back to working on his laptop. And afterwards, he pulled me aside and, this being 2006 or so, politely said, you bleep. That was the bleeping most annoying bleeping thing I've ever heard, you bleep. Oh, what? Huh? What? Uh, OK, calm down. What's going on? And eventually, we got to the understanding that the problem was I said, think like an attacker, as if it was obvious. And he had no idea what I meant. And so he didn't even feel like he could ask another question, because I said it like it was obvious. And so it totally shut him down and pushed him out of the meeting. It pushed him out of being a part of that collaboration. And so I learned from that experience that serious work is really helped by structure. Something like Stride really compares. Because here, OK, we can think about spoofing. We can delve into it. Trap number two is your never done threat modeling. If we're in an industrial sort of con, and I, so I drew this hamster wheel of pain when I started simplifying things. And this is the four questions, right? Model, what are we working on? Identify threats, what can go wrong? Mitigate, what do we do about it? And then did we do a good job? And you can go around and around. And if you're, and I hope that some of you will be inspired to go back to work on Monday or go back to a class project on Monday and say, hey, we should threat model it. And you'll go to your boss, and your boss or your professor will say, how long will this take? And you say, well, you're never done threat modeling. <laughs> you, you see the problem. And so I have learned to estimate how much time will these things take. And I have learned that, well, you're never done. If you can get started and if you can show value in most projects that I work on, 
there's time to do a little bit more of it until it feels like we're done, until it feels like we've really been structured and systematic in how we've gone through the system so that we understand the security risks that it faces. Trap number three is to say the way to threat model is. And I used to do this all the time too. People would come to me and say, hey, how do I threat model this? And I'd say data flow diagrams and stride. They're your, they're your go-tos, they're great. And I realized that if someone was coming to me and saying, hey Adam, I'm developing a program, what language should I use? I would ask them questions, right? Maybe if they're writing a device driver, they should, or an IoT Internet of Things thing, they should write it in C. If you want to write an insecure web app, you should write it in PHP. <laughs> um, hey, languages have different strengths and weaknesses. It's about trade-offs. And so now when I think about threat modeling, what are you working on? What are we working on? What can go wrong? And let's figure out what the right way to answer your question is rather than me jumping to an assumption. So trap number three is thinking about threat modeling as monolithic processes. And you might have thought the Legos were just there for fun, but in fact, I think about building blocks that we can attach to each other as fundamental to threat modeling. And so we have building blocks like data flow diagrams or swim lane diagrams for expressing the system we're working on. Uh, and swim lanes are you know, those long lines, packets flow back and forth between them. And when we go to identify threats, we can use stride, we can use KPEC, a pattern library from MITRE. We can use attack trees. We can use kill chains. And we can, we can substitute one block for another so that we threat model in a way that's appropriate to the system that we're working on. I'm going to skip over some of the privacy threat modeling techniques for right now and say that the different tools that we have for threat modeling work differently for different people. And so Stride is great if you're a security person and you know and you know how to think about spoofing. Kill Chain is great for security, operational security people. Attack trees are a way of organizing our thinking. And then if I'm working with someone who's an expert in databases or networking or usability, and they need help, with, and they're not an expert in security, KPAC, Common Attack Pattern Enumeration and Categorization, is a collection of patterns like SQL injection, is code data confusion that occurs in web-fronted databases, and the way you detect it is this, and the way you deal with it is that. And so it's information that, for me, feels a little tedious. It feels like I don't need to go read all of this. But if you're not a security expert, boy, is it a great resource. And so you can threat model using that instead of some of these um, more expert-centered techniques. Checklists. People ask me, you know, Adam, can you just give me a checklist of all the things that can go wrong in my system? And I say, huh, are you doing something new and innovative? And they say, oh, yeah, we're doing this and this and this. And I say, great. Attackers are going to attack that in innovative ways. You need to think about, you need to reason by analogy. I can't give you a list of five or seven things that are yes or no items and expect that it's going to cover everything that's going to go wrong with the application. So trap number four is to think that threat modeling is one skill. You might say, I should learn to threat model, and I encourage you to do so. And when you do so, I encourage you to think that threat modeling is this big set of activities in the same way that software development is a big set of activities. If you say, I'm going to learn to program, you might learn an editor. You might learn a language like C or Python. You might learn methodologies like Agile or Scrum or Waterfall. And in, if you try and do all of that at once, you're going to find yourself overwhelmed. So in threat modeling, I like to think of techniques, things like how to draw a good data flow diagram, how to use stride, how to use an attack tree, and then a repertoire of knowledge where I know about tools like FireSheep, Hydra, Kali Linux for pen testing. FireSheep and Hydra are spoofing tools. Um, and I read a lot of books. I learn about what's happening, and I can bring this to bear. 
And so sometimes people will say to me, oh, no one would ever do that. Um, and when someone says that, I used to jump in because I, I, I know a lot of the little details. And I would say, hey, here's an example. And sometimes they would say, great, let's fix it. And sometimes they would say, no, but no one would ever do that. Wait a minute, I just gave you a real world example of a time someone had done exactly that. And I realized that people mean, mean two things. One is no one would ever do that. And two is, I don't have time to fix this problem. And so now I ask the question, if I give you an example of a time somebody did this thing, will you agree to fix it? And so I find that really helps. But a lot of threat modeling is using this repertoire of knowledge, using this, these techniques to analogize and reason about a new system that you're working on or a new system that you're looking into. So trap number five is thinking that threat modeling will be easy. Um, and I like to analogize to driving. And when I learned to drive, I went into a parking lot and I drove around and the car went all sorts of ways and I had no skill at using the gas pedal. And boy, then I tried to learn to drive a manual car and um, that was a whole nother nightmare. And now I don't even think about it, right? Now, now, you know, I try not to talk on the phone, but now I just drive. It's become second nature. And sometimes when you start to learn to threat model, it can feel a little bit like learning how to drive a car, that there are so many things to do that it's just intimidating. And I want to encourage you to plan to work through that, to understand that your first one might be difficult, your second one might be difficult, but as you build skill, as you build ability, it will get easier. Trap number six is thinking that threat modeling is for specialists. If only the guy at the front does any threat modeling, we're missing out on all the brains behind him. That doesn't seem very useful. And so, and so my, the trap is thinking that threat modeling is for specialists. And it's my hope, one of the reasons that I continue to work in threat modeling is that I hope that threat modeling will become like version control, that everyone working in technology understands how to do a little bit of version control. There'll still be room for specialists, but not, you won't need to call in a specialist all the time. Trap number seven is threat modeling with the wrong focus. And there are a few wrong focuses that people like to jump on. For example, assets. Um, if, no one, if I have nothing worth stealing, why do I need to threat model this? That's a good question, isn't it? So I should start by making a list of all of my assets. All of the things that attackers want to steal, all of the things that I want to protect, they're not quite the same, all of the stepping stones. Because, and that's great, but what we're working on is a new feature for content upload to the bank. But it's a bank, so there's a general ledger, there's money to steal, let's put that on our asset list. How does content upload relate to that? Well, we've got to make a list of assets. You end up spending all your time making a list of things that you can't influence or change. It's not very useful work. So the variant of this, or another, another thing that it's, you know, make a list of your attackers. If no one's going to attack this system, why are we bothering to defend it? Seems like a good question, right? So when I was working on my threat modeling book, I did a survey. I did a literature review. I looked at all of the lists of attackers. Hold that thought for just a second. I, I know all the lists of attackers that are out there. And recently, I was reading an article about um, Apple screen time and about how kids were bypassing Apple screen time. And let me tell you, kids who want to use their phones are very clever. I know you're shocked to hear that, but it's true. Um, and so some of the attacks were things like changing the time zone on the phone or turning on screen recording and then handing your phone back to your parents so they could do something, and then you watch the little letters pop up and you see their password. 
Now, I told you, I've done a survey of all of the lists of attackers in the world. And you know who's not on any of them? Kids. <laughs> so, so starting by thinking about your attackers is an opportunity for an own goal. It's an opportunity to miss an important set of attackers and not think about them. Whereas if we start from what we're working on, we know that if we're building something, if we're deploying something, if we're working on it, we know what that thing is. And if we center our thinking on what we are working on, we have fewer opportunities for mistakes, we have fewer opportunities for rat holes. So, um, variant of this again is that threat modeling should focus on finding threats. It's important to find those threats. It's also important to make sure there's time to fix them, to address them. And if you just find a list of threats and don't do anything about them, please send that list to me. I'll make good use of it, I promise. Now, remember trap number three, the way to threat model is. I'm telling you, don't do this, don't do that. If these methods work for you, I'm not saying change. I know people that these methods work well for. Okay, but I've also seen that they have these failure modes that we should be aware of even as we're doing them. Trap number eight is to strain against the supply chain. There are different security fixes which are easy to put in place at different parts of the supply chain. So if I'm making something, if I'm making chips and I'm selling those chips to device makers, I can choose whether or not that system on a chip is going to have encrypted memory or a trusted bootloader that verifies a signature before loading anything. If that's there, then the device maker I sell it to can take advantage of that feature. If not, someone who opens up the device is going to be able to modify things. And it's really challenging to build security on top of that if the building blocks you need are not present. Oh, yes. So now the flip side is that um, that system on a chip maker can't read the logs, at least we hope they can't read the logs, of what their chips are all doing. That's a choice that their customers and their customers' customers might want to make. And so reading the logs is easier at a different point in the chain. And understanding the, the, the opportunities and costs at each point in the chain makes it much easier to construct a secure system. So. There's a few things that people use to deliver on these things. And one that I want to talk about in particular is non-requirements. I had the pleasure, back while I was still at Microsoft, of working on a document called the 10 Immutable Laws of Security, version 2. <laughs> and the 10 Immutable Laws of Security say things like, if an attacker gets admin on your computer, it's not your computer anymore. Or if an attacker has unlimited physical access to your computer, it's not your computer anymore. And, and I have here an iPhone, and you may remember a few years ago there was a tragedy in San Bernardino where someone shot up a community center, murdered a bunch of people, and the FBI had his iPhone. They had unlimited physical access to his iPhone, and they really, really wanted to get into it and they couldn't. These 10 immutable laws are not 10 immutable laws of security. They are the Windows threat model. They're the thing that says Microsoft will fix bugs like this, but if you violate one of these laws, you're outside our threat model. We're not going to fix that for you. It's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. You can run your business on Windows. You can run your business on Macs or iOS or Linux or what have you, and you can understand Okay, if people have unlimited physical access to the Windows machine, it's not my computer anymore, and they're changing that a little bit with Surface. But the important thing to do to understand is that that document is a security guide. It's a document that allows people to understand what expectations they can have of something higher earlier in the supply chain. 
Trap number nine is a laser-like focus on threats. There's always this interplay of attacks and mitigations and requirements which happens. And requirements drive threats and threats drive, drive requirements. And what do I mean by that? So someone might say, the plans for this battle station must not fall into enemy hands. Great. Now I know that there's a confidentiality requirement on that data tape. Um, or we might have a bunch of open source advocates who say, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. We should publish the plans for our battle station, and the people of the galaxy will help us make it more secure. You seem skeptical. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but some people might seem skeptical. And so we can say, no, that feels like a threat. I don't think it's a good idea to publish it. And we can, through that threat, discover what our requirement is. Threats need mitigation, and mitigations can be bypassed. So if I'm threat modeling my house, and I'm worried about my front door, I'm going to put a stronger lock on it, and then I'm done, right? No, you could still pick the lock, you can drill the lock, you can kick the door in. And so I can use a lock with a plate, I can put a steel frame around my door, and then the attackers can still bypass that with a battering ram or maybe by going um, into the little rock next to my door that has the key hidden in it. Um, so there's always, a, there's always an interplay between the threats and the mitigations that we have to pay attention to as we design systems. Lastly, um, if there's no mitigation, we should simplify our requirements, right? If we're not going to protect against admin, let's not half pretend that we do and invest in features that sort of protect us against admin as long as the admin's a nice person and decides not to delete the log files or whatever. Let's simplify our requirements and put our engineering effort onto things where it will have higher payoff. And uh, so there's this dotted line here, right? And what I drew this I drew this picture while I was working on my book, and I really wanted my model to be symmetrical. And I was really annoyed that it wasn't symmetrical. And so I spent some time thinking about it, and I put the dotted line in there, and I didn't know what it meant. And I was talking to a friend, and he said, oh, obviously, a requirement to put a mitigation in place where there's no threat, it's a perfect description of compliance programs. Um, now, the other, the other element of a laser-like focus on threats that I want to talk about is threat modeling is a set of technical activities. And so it's really easy to focus solely on the technical activities. But threat modeling is also an opportunity to collaborate. What are we working on? What are we going to do about it? And so we have a opportunity or a need to bring in our soft skills to communicate because oftentimes threat modeling can sound a little bit like calling someone's baby ugly. Oh man, your system is super insecure. Here, 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 here. You must suck at security. <laughs> um, way to make yourself popular, dude. It's important to recognize that the work that we do in security analysis happens in a social context. And if we focus not if we focus in only on the threats, if we focus in only on the technical problems, we have an opportunity to limit our effectiveness by ignoring the social realities. Whereas if we engage with those social realities, if we show up early and say, I'd like to help you build a more secure system, threat modeling is a really valuable set of techniques to help us help the people around us deliver better and better, more secure, more predictable technologies. And so this brings me to trap number 10, which is to threat model at the wrong time. You don't want to be like, oops, I have a different slide here. I'm pushing my, I'm going to slow down on the button pushing. There we are. So trap number 10. It's to threat model at the wrong time. You don't want to be like this guy 
standing on the bridge of your new Death Star, shiny or not, but standing on the bridge of your Death Star, and some flunky shows up and says, sir, we've analyzed their attack pattern and there is a danger. The remainder of his day was very bad. You want a threat model early when there's a chance to, I don't know, put some netting across the trench or uh, maybe some steel plates. I don't know what the right fix is, but I do know that there wasn't really time for them to figure it out. And so to summarize, anyone can threat model and everyone should. The four questions are easy to use, easy to get started with, and I encourage you after this conference to go and threat model something. Give it a shot, see what you learn. I really believe, I spend my time these days teaching threat modeling, helping organizations develop threat modeling and secure development processes. And what I've seen across industry sectors, across countries, across levels of experience, is that everyone is able to learn these skills. With practice and diligence, people get it and they start delivering better products and I feel, I feel great when they do. There's a lot of traps that people fall into. So if you've fallen into one of those traps in the past, I apologize, give it another shot. And the reason I say this is in the 25 plus years I've been working in security, the work I do in threat modeling is some of the most impactful and meaningful work I get to do. It is the highest value stuff I do on a day-to-day -day basis by far. And it's the best way to drive security through your product, your service, your system. One last thing to say, George Box, British statistician, said all models are wrong and some models are useful. What he meant by this is that the act of creating a model, the act of abstracting away facts about the system means it's wrong. Get over it. It doesn't matter that it's wrong. What matters is that it's useful. If the model is helping you find security problems, that's, that's, what, you, that's what you should care about. With that, I am happy to take questions. I'll mention there are some resources. I blog about threat modeling a lot, have a book. There's an, OWASP, there's an OWASP Slack channel. The threat modeling channel is pretty active. It's a great place to come and join in. But I am happy to say um, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, thank you for letting me speak to you in English. It's better for all of us, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to take questions that you have. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if we have, do we have microphone runner people or people just want to shout out a question or two if they have them? No. Hands in them. Okay. I'm going to stand here until someone asks a question, so you better <laughs> think of one. <laughs> Um, so do I know if Microsoft still uses threat modeling as one of the basic techniques in their secure development process? And I no longer am able to speak for them, but I sure believe that they do. <laughs> yes. So does, does this help you when a designer puts a weakness in the system for on purpose? Good extension of the Star Wars theme there. Um, and, and first, I will say, going back to Rogue One and Star Wars geeking just a little bit, that this flaw in the Death Star is completely obvious. 
right? There's all this words about it's hidden. No, there's obviously no baffles. There's no blowout panel. There's a big fusion reaction that can move this thing through space and no way for it to vent energy. The problem is completely obvious. Um, so bad design in, in real world systems will often show through when you threat model. And so if someone is trying to build extra functionality that they shouldn't in ways that are very obvious, threat modeling will help pull that out. Um, if you're implementing a buffer overflow or some very technical flaw in some specific place, it might help us notice that we're not really validating data well or doing other things, but it might not catch the flaw. Yes? Um, I feel like there's always a little bit of air of mystery around threat modeling. I mean, it's obviously really difficult, um, but do you know a good resource of examples of concrete pieces of software where a threat model was done and was published somewhere where we can have a look at and say, this is what it should really look like? So, so the question is, are there concrete examples of what it should look like? And I have a few in my book, and there, there are unfortunately few examples where people have published their threat models. I think that would, you know, since I'm here at a technical university, I think that would make a great set of projects for some students to do in a way that would get them some good positive attention and make a great contribution to the world. So I'm sorry we don't have a better answer and I'm hoping we're, we can fix that together. <laughs> yes? Is there a short guidance or best practices to start threat software? Is there a short guidance or best practices? Yes, so on the first slide, there is a card deck I created and I'm can, can we back up to the, the About Adam slide? Thank you. It's called Elevation of Privilege. And the idea behind it is it's a card deck that has hints on it that will help you threat model. And so if we go to slide two. Okay, so over here you can see card deck. And if you go to GitHub Adam Showstack EOP, it's Creative Commons license, you can download it, there's ways you can buy it via Amazon. And it's, it is designed to answer specifically this question, right? How do I get started? How do I, how do I get going with threat modeling? And then there was another question, yes? What's your opinion? Does it make sense to train an artificial intelligence to do threat modeling? Does it make sense to train an artificial intelligence to do threat modeling? Um, it makes almost precisely as much sense as training the artificial intelligence to write code, which turns out to be a hard problem in all sorts of ways, and I think exactly the same problems apply to really deep AI on threat modeling. I think there's actually a huge amount we could do with some pretty simple program analysis to say, this code that you are writing exhibits this higher level threat um, and I think that's also a great research area I'd love to see people working in. How are we doing on time? Do we have Perfect. one more? Perfect. One more question. One, one more, one final question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, how would you have validated the death star threat model? Like <laughs> how would I have validated the death star threat model? Um, so step one is to ask what we're working on. Step two is to ask what can go wrong, um, and they should have considered stub fighters. Stub fighters were an obviously missing part of the threat model, um, and they should have taken a look at it. But, but um, on, on that note, I'd, I'd like to mention a great little video entitled The Death Star Architect Speaks Out. Um, and it's a two-minute animated video in which the Death Star architect says, who the heck told me to worry about Jedi? The Jedi were extinct. I wasn't told to worry about Jedi. I designed a perfectly good Death Star because nobody else could make that shot. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, thank you very much for your time, your attention, your questions, and I look forward to talking more once I'm off stage. So thank you. Sam, great. Very good. Thank you. Very good.